very few things happen at the right time, and the rest do not happen at all. The conscientious historian will correct these defects. And this week's opening quote comes from Herodotus. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix. So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. Well, it's nice to be back, folks. I apologize for not being able to bring you a show last week, but I was away speaking in Philadelphia, and it was actually a really good gig in Philadelphia. This was the first Anarchadelphia, the first anarchist conference they've held in Philadelphia, and it's actually the first time the organizers had organized the conference, and I think they did very well. It was a very good event. It ran very smoothly. There were some good speakers there. And overall, a good time was had by all, and it was a pleasure to be there. So if I saw you there, then thank you for coming. And if you missed that event, do be sure to look out for it next year because it was a great event. I'm sure it was probably live streamed as well, and there'll probably be some videos of it out eventually. I don't think that will be too far down the track. I will see some of that for sure. But at the moment, I find myself in a cheap motel in L.A., getting ready for another conference next week, which is the Avatars of the Earth Gathering at Mount Shasta. So if you can hear any traffic noise and stuff going on in the background, folks, it's because that's just my location at the moment. So we've had the normal bird noises and kookaburra noises and the things that we have in the background when I'm home in Australia replaced with the noise of Los Angeles traffic. And it's interesting that every time I have some time off the radio show, things seem to go pear-shaped in the world. The latest attempt at vilifying Iran is very predictable and very transparent as well. The attack on the oil plant in Saudi Arabia, folks. I mean, this was not an Iranian missile that went and blew this up. Very likely it was a Saudi Arabian missile. Or perhaps an Israeli missile, or perhaps it didn't even happen at all. Perhaps it was just a piece of drone that they used, some wreckage from the drone. Actually, it actually kind of looks like the Roswell crash all over again, folks. So who knows what it was or whether it even happened. And you've got to really look at the situation in the Gulf as well. You've got to ask yourself why Iran would attack Saudi Arabia at this time, especially with this entire U.S. fleet poised there to stomp on it if it takes a step out of line. But you see, the United States and Israel really want to push this war with Iran, and they can't really do it. They've been attempting to kickstart this war for a few years now. We saw that ridiculous false flag attack against the oil tanker a few months ago, which they tried to blame on Iran. It was obviously not Iran. And why Iran would attack a half-empty tanker in the Gulf anyway, right when they were told not to do anything or they might get bombed. I mean, you know, this is the sort of stuff that we see from these people. But it was a half-empty tanker. It wasn't even a tanker that looked like it was in use. So, you know, all very predictable stuff, folks. But this is the sort of stuff they're using. You know, any excuse they can, any little thing they can do to point the finger at Iran is what they're doing. Anything they can think of. But as I said, Israel and the United States have been really attempting to kickstart this war. And the world just isn't going to buy it. But... If Saudi Arabia does it, then the world may just step in because the world won't want to interfere because, oh, this will just be two Arab nations squabbling again because most of the world, of course, views Iran as another Arab nation, even though they're not Arabs, they're Persians. But to the West, it's just the Arabs squabbling again, and so they'll probably be more likely to accept a Saudi Arabian incursion into Iran. And then, of course, the United States and Israel will have to go in there and help their ally than any type of US or Israeli incursion into the country. So that's why they've got Saudi Arabia to do this. And it's all very predictable, folks. And hopefully if we make enough noise about it, then it won't happen because it is really escalating at the moment. They're really trying to ramp it up and really go in there. And hopefully if we can make enough noise about it, then it won't happen. The way we stopped a couple of other incursions in there. And the claim Saudi Arabia is making, folks, the righteous indignation they're attempting to display on television, saying, well, the drone attacked a civilian area. These were civilians who were damaged and hurt. I mean, when has Saudi Arabia cared about killing civilians? Prince Salman is a full-blown psychopath who beheads anybody who looks at him the wrong way willy-nilly. Plus, they've been destroying children in Yemen for the last five years with some, one of the longest bombing campaigns in the history of war. And here they are saying, oh my God, they hit civilians. I mean, come on, folks, if people can't see the theatrics of this, then I really don't know what we could do to help them. But it's so ridiculous and so predictable and such an incredible display of hypocrisy from Saudi Arabia, a nation, a heartless nation who has no problem murdering anybody it likes, claiming that it's 
caring about human rights and caring about civilians being damaged or injured is just ludicrous to the extreme. And the destruction that this nation is inflicting upon the people of Yemen is actually unforgivable, folks. And Yemen is a beautiful country. It's an incredible country. Some amazing architecture. You know, Yemen is one of the poorest countries on earth with some of the most beautiful cities left on earth. There were cities there that people say were built by the sons of Noah. That's how old the country is. Really, really beautiful architecture, all being destroyed to rubble and bombed into obliteration by the Saudi Arabians with the full consent and support and even weapons provided for them by the Trump administration. Gotta love that one, folks. Yeah, there's Trump there attempting to make the world a better place while supporting the destruction of Yemen. Absolutely, hands down, no problem at all. And it really is absolutely disgraceful to see. And the best thing we can really do in the face of this, folks, is just spread the word to people, help people become aware of what is really happening. It really is up to us to get the word out to the people about what's going on with this whole scenario that they're tending to construct in the Middle East. And it is just another scenario, folks. More theatre for the masses. And again, all very predictable. But enough of that topic. And wanted to continue a little bit on from the last show that I did this week and talk to you a little bit about history. On the last show that I put out, I was asking if history is a lie, how deep is the lie? And it would appear that the lie is very deep. And actually, a little apology for something that I did on last week's show or the week before last show, folks. I was talking about the mystery of some electric trams that used to run in the United States, and I inadvertently put footage of the San Francisco cable car system in there. These are not the trams that I was referring to. I'm referring to an electric tram system that existed around about the turn of the last century, and when I get back to Australia, I will dig up that footage and rectify that error. So sorry about that one. Bit of a mistake, including cable car footage when I was referring to electric trams. But you get that when you're in a rush and you don't have the assistant that I've been searching for for so long. I really do need to get an assistant, folks. It's very difficult to do all this on one's own. One tends to make mistakes occasionally, especially when one is getting ready for travel. But that's just the way it goes, so I'm sure you can bear with me on that one. But it was really quite fascinating, folks, this electric tram system that they had in the United States. There was also a pneumatic underground rail system, like a tube system. I think was in New York and that was prior to the 1900s or at least around the turn of the century the 1800s and 1900s so all sorts of weird stuff was going on there that has been kind of expunged from our history books you can find it if you look but it's not there in the mainstream not stuff that we're generally taught but it's an interesting question folks you know if history is a lie and indeed it is Just how deep does the lie go? That's the question. A lot of people would ask the question, why? I mean, you know, why would they bother to hide history? Why would they bother to change history? I mean, it's all about what happens in the present. Who cares what happened in the past? Here we are. Let's make the best of what we got and move forward. A lot of people actually think that way. But the reason, folks, is for control. Because if you don't know where you come from, then you don't know where you're going. If you don't know what you once had, then you don't know what's been taken from you. As said by George Orwell, the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. And as said by Marcus Garvey, a man with no history is like a tree with no roots. And that is why they have stolen our history. That is why they've hidden our history. And that's why they've changed our history. And there is, as I said, folks, every evidence that it is a very, very different world to what we think it is. And it's been a very, very different process that's happened to bring us to the point that we are now at. Attempting to determine what that process was is another story. I mean, it's very difficult to know. But what we do know, what we can clearly determine simply by traveling around the world and looking at things, is that what we've been told is quite obviously untrue. The problem being, of course, in even making such a statement is that as soon as one makes such a statement, everyone else wants to know, well, if it isn't true, then what is true? And that's the question, folks, and that's what we're attempting to determine. It's a slow process, but there's a lot of people working on it, and that's a good thing. There really has been a lot of people digging down this rabbit hole lately, 
a lot of people have gotten wind of the fact that our past is actually very different to what we've been told and that it's important that we find out just what happened. You know, it's important for human freedom. It's important for us to have any chance of escaping this slavery system we're living in to at least have some inkling of how we got here. And a lot of people have been seeing the importance of it and that's been really wonderful to see. And it's been really good to see that so many people have been respecting each other's research and collaborating and sharing and taking aspects of each other's research on. And between everybody, we're sort of starting to formulate some sort of a picture of what actually is going on here. And even in looking at all this, you know, once you start looking at the information and start going down the rabbit holes, it's very important not to start making claims along the way. Yeah, because we don't know what happened is the situation that we're in. I mean, what we do know is that we've been lied to. What we do know is that the past is different to what we've been told. And looking at some of the things we've discovered, I mean, you know, even the search for Atlantis, we've discovered that Atlantis was everywhere. The entire Earth was populated by a completely different culture to the one we've got now, and there are traces of that culture everywhere on every continent. The buildings that we're calling Tartarian buildings are found all over the world in every country. And there's also an incredible amount of ruins that are found beneath the oceans. Now, looking for Atlantis beneath the ocean and wondering where it was, as I said, it was everywhere. Because there are ruins to be found in the oceans off the coast of the United States, off the coast of Japan, off the coast of Indonesia, through the Mediterranean. I mean, everywhere, folks. There are ruins beneath the oceans all over the earth which indicate that there was a very, very large culture that was once here. And none of the destruction of these cultures is mentioned in any of our history books. And really think about this, folks. I mean, these ruins beneath the oceans are not just some random ruin somewhere. There are literally dozens upon dozens of huge ruins beneath all the oceans all over the earth. Think about that. What happened? Why isn't it in our history? We hear about little inundations here and there. We hear about Alexandria sinking beneath the waves or whatever. But what happened? Why is there so many ruins all over the earth? What happened? I mean, sure, it's not like the entire oceans are sort of paved with ruins. But it doesn't matter what ocean you go to, you'll find ruins in that ocean somewhere. That's the point. So what happened? Why are all these ruins there? And again, why is it not in our history? Yeah, even with what we're looking at with the mud flood, what we're calling the mud flood, none of this is in our history books. The changes that happened to the maps, none of these changes are in our history books. And that's been very interesting rabbit hole to go down as well, looking at the maps, looking at the fact that California was marked as an island around about the 1600s and then came back to being a peninsula in the 1800s. And if you go back before then you'll find that in the 1500s it was a peninsula and if you go back even further than that you'll find that in the 1400s there's maps that show it as an island so it appears that it goes from being a peninsula to being an island and this happens every couple of hundred years according to the maps anyway and i find that to be quite an interesting thing there's also the fact that there's maps that show that there is land at the north pole that we are unaware of and that this land was removed from maps around about the early 1600s. The land appears to have changed over a period of about 100 years. Portions of it appear to have been inundated with ocean, and then the whole lot is gone by the early 1600s. I mean, whether it is actually gone or whether it was simply taken from the maps is another question. And have you ever questioned why the oceans are salt? That's something that's always struck a chord with me. You know, all the... Water on the earth is created through precipitation, through evaporation, through springs. Why are the oceans salt? It's an interesting question. What, from grinding down minerals for billions of years to create all the sand that we see there? Really? Is that what happened? Hmm. Things we've also confirmed is the existence of free energy, the existence of buildings that produce energy. And this is pretty well confirmed, folks, because there is so much evidence of it all over the world. The pictures of buildings producing free energy, the pictures of old fireplaces, which seem to have a heating plate in there and no real room to put the logs pictures of what look like electrical devices while there's still soldiers standing around on horseback 
the depictions of people having tournaments with energy weapons and some of the buildings that have been built by this culture, buildings that we simply cannot build today. Some of the sculptures that were done by this culture, sculptures that seem almost impossible by modern day standards and some of the buildings are absolutely incredible. And some of the artwork was incredible. As I've mentioned to you before, the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci, we simply don't know how these paintings were done. You know, the paint on them is too thin for them to be done by any method that is currently known. And this isn't just a curious oddity. This isn't just something that's a great mystery, because that's what they do, you know. They get these things which are completely unexplainable, and they just put it in the great mystery basket, and it becomes a fascination for everyone. We all look at it and go, ooh, I wonder how they did it. But it's more than that, folks. What it shows is the existence of technology that we are unaware of. Now, these paintings were not done by any method that is known to man, so how were they done? Are they photographs? Are they prints? I mean, what was it? And this is just a couple of hundred years ago. It's not like this is hidden mystery technology from way back in our distant past. This is just a couple of hundred years ago. Paintings were being constructed, pictures were being constructed by methods that we do not have today, that we are unaware of, technology that is not known to us. Very interesting stuff, folks. We've also found a lot of information regarding the existence of electric energy weapons, directed energy weapons that existed in the mid-1800s as well. These were quite widespread, quite common. The fascia that they used in World War I, or prior to World War I, that what was depicted as the fascia, the, you know, the axe with the bundle of sticks around it, it appears as this is actually some type of energy weapon, folks. There's shows that I did about this recently, a year or two ago. There's also other people that have spoken about this as well. Martin Liebke has spoken about it. I think John Levi has also spoken about it and others. Speaking of John Levi, actually, I saw a video on his channel a couple of weeks ago where he was simply narrating a couple of chapters from a book. And the book was written by one of the early explorers or early settlers in the United States and was talking about all of the incredible architecture that was found in the country, the incredible ruins, the amazing detail of some of the ruins and some of the stuff that we've been talking about is regard to Tartaria. This has all been found in a history book and I'll see if I can locate that video and if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this show on YouTube, I'll be sure to put a link below in the description. We've discovered the existence of electric machine guns, electric cannons, electric Weapons that changed the face of warfare according to the journals of the times. This was in the mid-1800s. And as I said, some of the sculptures that were done, sculptures done in marble, for example, the fisherman with the net, and this is all supposedly carved out of one piece of marble, and yet the net is even a different colour to the fisherman, and quite a remarkable piece of sculpture. And some of the sculptures that we see, and even some of the buildings that we see, are simply impossible to build by today's standards. Something else that we saw in World War I was the use of what appeared to be some sort of sound devices, possibly some sort of sound or frequency weapon. These are passed off to us as being acoustic locators because there are devices that look quite similar to these that were acoustic locators, and there are devices that were acoustic locators that they used to use before radar. You know, a man would sit there with a couple of huge cones on a stand and a couple of tubes going to his ears, so he would basically extend the size of his ears so he could hear planes coming from a distance. This was radar before they had radar, folks, but some of the stuff that they've got there really doesn't look like acoustic locators. They look more like sound frequency weapons. So you've got to question what these things were as well. And the thing is, folks, when looking at all of this stuff, it all really depends on how prepared people are to think outside of the box. You know, just how prepared people are to accept the idea that history has been fabricated and to really be able to see how easy it would have been to do this. You know, it seems a pretty outrageous thing to be able to fabricate history. I mean, how could you teach an entire population, an entire race, an entire world a false history? You know, how could it be done? How long would it take to do it? And this is where we start, again, factoring in the concept of the orphan trains and the repopulation of the world with children that appears to have happened around about the late 1800s. This is a very, very important piece of the puzzle. Because think about it, you know, all the stuff that we know 
is just stuff we've read from books. We go to school, we learn this stuff, and we just take it at face value, and we accept that it's true. But how do we know if any of it is actually true? What, just because it's in a book and it's taught at the school, that makes it true? You know, we see all these monuments, we see all these ruins, we see all these things around the place, and we go and find history books, and either there's some explanation there which never quite satisfies, or there's simply no explanation. It's simply lost. It's just another one of those mysteries, something that we can't explain. And the thing is, you know, when you find things that you can't explain, well, that's all very well, something we can't explain. But but when you keep finding things you can't explain, they just begin to add up and add up and add up, and you end up with a situation where most of the stuff that we've got in the world, most of the stuff that's lying around all over the place is stuff we can't explain, not according to the current timeline, not according to the current academic version of history. None of it can be explained. And again, really getting to the bottom of the mystery depends on how prepared you are to think outside the box. And that doesn't mean constructing a new box for yourself by adopting belief systems along the way. Now, it's really, really important to keep an open mind when looking at all of this stuff. Because if history is different, well, you know, the question is just how different is it? And again, this is going to be dependent by... Your belief system is going to be determined by how prepared you are to think outside whatever box you're thinking in. You know, and this includes our current concepts of physics and everything. I mean, if they've lied to us about one thing, I mean, just how big is the lie? How many things are they prepared to lie to us about? I mean, this is where the flat earthers get so much fuel for the fire that they're burning, folks. Because the earth is different to what we're told. That doesn't mean that it's flat. But it's certainly not what we're told. I mean, for all we know, the Earth could be 10 or 12 times bigger than what it is, could be twice as big as what it is, could be a huge place, and we're living within a contained environment within it. Could be it's a huge place, and we're simply working mining operations within one section of it. Things could be vastly different to what we're being told. This could be why it seems like it's flat to some people. I mean, how would you know? And honestly, ask yourself, and be honest about it, how would you know? What, because you were told? That could be why the globe earthers and the flat earthers both have no way of solving their argument because it could be that both arguments are in some way right. And the thing is that it's not even really about that. It's about the current state of the human condition and the fact that we are not free enough to have any of these mysteries solved. That's why I've often said, you know, the whole concept of the truth movement is even a loaded term because no matter what truth you're looking at, you might be looking at one particular truth and it may very well be true. But then that becomes your focus and the same happens for somebody else who's looking at a different truth, which may well be true, but that becomes their focus as well. And then they argue about it with everybody else. And they're not looking at the overall truth because they don't know what the overall truth is because they're not free enough to know what the overall truth is. You know, when people think of divide and conquer, they don't really look at it on the micro scale. They don't really see how much it affects them on their daily lives and how much some of the thoughts they're having may not actually be their own thoughts and some of the movements that they're supporting may actually be simply designed to compartmentalize them into one particular way of thinking because all of the so-called problems that we find and all the so-called truths that we attempt to uncover are all simply symptoms of the overlying factor, the overlying problem, which is the fact that we're not free. And that's what creates all of these situations and that's what this movement should really be about. That's why it shouldn't even be called a truth movement because No one knows what the truth is. And as I've said so many times, in today's psychological environment, the truth seems to be pretty subjective and dependent and determined by what people want to believe the truth is. And really what this is about is freedom. And freedom is what it has always been about. And all of this arguing about what is the truth and what isn't the truth is preventing us from ever establishing freedom. And that is how the divide and conquer meme actually works over human psychology. And it's important that people see this. It's important that people recognise this or we're never going to find a way out of this mess. You know, it's just important that people see how much we are being played, even how much the resistance is being played. So many agents out there planting seeds of distrust. So many people out there making claims 
and so many people failing to even want to consider that there may be a bigger picture to all of this. It may seem very esoteric, but I remember when I was a child, when I found out just how messed up the world was, when I realized that we had to buy land and all that sort of stuff when I was like four years old, one of the things that used to make me wonder was, where was the magic? Where did all the magic go? Why wasn't there magic in the world? And it's an interesting thing for a child to be thinking those thoughts because at four years old, I hadn't read any stories about Peter Pan or fairies in the garden or gnomes and any of that sort of stuff. I wasn't subject to any of that type of information when I was four years old, but I knew magic was real and I knew there was supposed to be magic in the world, but what we would determine to be magic anyway. The question is, how would I know that at four years old when I was living in a very straight suburban family with a single mother and two sisters and we were even being moved around all over the place because mum and dad were breaking up and blah, blah, blah. So we were kind of all over the place and I wasn't subject to any of that type of information to even know what fairies or magic or any of that stuff was. I mean, we didn't have TV. TV hadn't even come to Australia when I was born. So how would I know the term magic? How would I know the magic was missing? And why would I be asking where it had gone if it wasn't something that I'd experienced before? And that was one of the big things that really struck me was when I found out that we had to buy land and I found out that we couldn't just go and live in the forest, I realized that I was living in the wrong world. I was not living in the world that I was supposed to be living in. And I used to talk to my teddy bear and ask him to please tell God to put me back onto the right world. And it was like a memory that I had. That's the thing, folks, you know. There's even the question of whether human consciousness is recycled through this realm and what form that recycling takes. There's all sorts of stuff going on here. Like I said, folks, it just depends on how prepared people are to think outside the box that they may be thinking in. You know, and how prepared they are to realize that a lot of the thoughts they're having are not their own. I mean, even when you try to bring this sort of stuff up to people, you'll get accused of new age thinking or whatever, which is just people's religious programming. You get accused of pantheism, all sorts of stuff. Again, people's religious programming, not their own thoughts. They're not simply keeping their mind open and being willing and able to accept all possibilities in an attempt to actually find out what the truth is. They're constrained by their belief systems and it happens in so many ways with so many topics and that is really one of the biggest obstacles we face to ever finding out what the truth is. But again, what is it about? Is it really about truth? Are we ever going to find what the truth is without freedom? So why don't we work on establishing that? Because once we have freedom, then the truth to what actually is going on here will become self-evident. But folks, I think we've reached break time, so I better leave it there for now. We're going to have a break. Thank you for joining me on the air today. It's always a pleasure to have your company, and I'll be able to speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so in looking at all of this, it's really determined by how far you are prepared to think outside the box, and as I said, by not developing another box to think within along the way. You know, very often we find stuff that we believe resonates with us. We adopt a belief system and then we judge everything according to that belief system and we shut ourselves off to other possibilities. And you've got to be open to all possibilities. You really do. And again, this is where the flat earth movement falls down because they have completely locked themselves into this belief that the earth is flat and now everything they investigate, they look at in accordance with that belief. When there could be something much vaster going on. Like I said, they could be within a small section, within a larger planet. How do you know? How would you possibly know? How would anybody know what this realm that we inhabit really is? Because all we've got to go on is the books that we're given. And as I've said, who wrote these books? Why do we take everything at face value? And you look at the government-controlled education system, folks. It hasn't really told us much truth. And so why would we expect to get the truth in any regard from any aspect of this system. And the thing is, as I've said so many times, we can look at it, we can go down these rabbit holes forever and ever and attempt to find out what's going on, but we will never find the truth because we're not free. And it's really where the system is going. You know, that's what's important because if we don't establish freedom soon, then we're going to pretty well lose what freedoms we have because we're getting led into this incredibly toxic smart dystopia 
while we're too busy worrying about how we got here and worried about the past and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it's very interesting. We need to know how we got here. we kind of got to juggle things and walk in both realms because while we're investigating the past and figuring out what actually happened, we need to very much pay attention to what's going on with the future and what's going on with our present, where we're being led right now, which, as I said, is directly into this smart system dystopia, which is being rolled out in every single country just using different methodologies, but it's happening the same in every country. Different methods, different strokes for different folks. Another question is, has it happened before? And I would suggest that it has. And if it has, then how many times has it happened? Yeah, but there is every indication that this has happened before. This is just a recycling thing that's going on. You know, when I look at the legends of the scrying mirrors and the sigils and the Lucifer system and all the stuff that's there to prepare us for these so-called end times, you know, I think these are prophecies. I think these are left there as warnings, left there so we will recognize when things are about to change, when these events are about to come about. And again, folks, you know, in all these questions that I pose on the radio shows, very often I get people writing to me attempting to answer some of the questions that I'm posing on the radio shows. And that isn't the reason that I do the shows or construct the shows in this way. It isn't the reason the dialogue comes out in the way it does anyway, because I don't construct the shows. But I just think it's important to encourage people to ask questions, you know, because I am a firm believer that the truth can never be told to people you can never tell someone the truth they won't listen they won't believe you real truth cannot be told real truth must be realized people need to see that it's not that they're wrong in what they're thinking it's just that they're perhaps not looking at a bigger picture and not seeing a broader view so they may well be right from the perspective that they've got. You know, no one likes to be told they're wrong. So it's important to encourage people to see that they are right in what they're looking at and the way they're thinking. It's just that there may be a bigger picture that they perhaps have not considered. And were they to do so, they may have some different views on what they're thinking. You know, it's just encouraging them to ask the questions to begin with. That's why I structure the shows in the way that I do. That's why... I, are constantly asking questions on the radio show and not attempting to present you with answers because it doesn't matter what I may believe to be true. It doesn't matter what I think I may know because it doesn't matter what you believe you know and whether you can convince other people to go along with what you believe you know to be true because the truth is how true do you know it to really be and real truth cannot be told. It must be realized. So you know, you don't teach people by attempting to convince them of the truth in what you believe you know. You would by encourage them to ask the questions to begin with. And that's why I structure the shows in this way. And there are a lot of questions, folks. It's just like I said, how prepared you are to think outside the box and how prepared you are to really question things and see where the answers lie. And some of the answers may be quite bizarre, but it just, again, is determined on what you wish to believe and whether you're constrained by a belief system along the way. As once said by someone, it may have been George Santayana. It could have been someone else. But the quote goes, and I'm paraphrasing, was that when all other possibilities have been eliminated, what remains must be the truth, however improbable it seems. It's kind of an Occam's razor type of thing, but... That's really the approach you have to have. And again, it is just determined by what you're prepared to believe or what you're prepared not to believe, how prepared you are to put your belief system down and think right outside the box. And having said that, considering the possibility of the world being repopulated with children, which did very much happen around about 1880, Again, if you want information on that, you can search for foundlings, foundling homes, and orphan trains, and you'll find an awful lot of information that exists regarding that event. Another question is the giants that were in such abundance as recently as 100 years ago. Yeah, and how big were the giants before then is the question. I mean, there's lots of pictures that we find, lots of images we see of what appear to be very large human bones that have been found. question is, of course, how real are many of the pictures? 
many of them are very likely simply photoshopped and done by people but then you don't know it could be a possibility that some of them are true which is why there's been so many of them that have been photoshopped just to muddy the waters that's the way counterintelligence works folks you embellish the truth to the point that it becomes non-believable but looking at these giants you've got to wonder how big were the people on the previous cycles yeah as i mentioned i think on the last show what if it was determined by consciousness what if consciousness and stature have something to do with each other what if it's got to do with the atmospheric levels and consciousness what if it's got to do with electromagnetism and atmospheric levels and consciousness i mean we don't know how it all works but what if the size of humanity the size of life on this earth is gradually reduced in size every time we have what people are determining to be a reset and whether these resets are natural or whether they're man-made whether they're brought about by some technological force whether they occur because of plasma events i mean we don't know what causes them but the question is do we see a reduction in stature every time one of these events happens as consciousness is further lowered and if so if that's the case then how big was life on this earth once you know the claim by many scientists that 99 percent of the life or even more than that 99.5 percent of the life that once existed on this earth is no longer here certainly poses that question as well because there simply isn't the land mass to contain that much life if that much life did exist on the earth it would have to go up so that means that everything that did exist would have to have been a lot larger than what it is now but when you consider this possibility and you factor in the possibility of cyclic cataclysms and also the concept of mass extinctions and mass petrification or at least what would be termed instantaneous petrification because petrification doesn't take millions of years like we've been told petrification can take place very quickly as quickly as like 30 years and even the electric universe guys say that petrification can take place virtually instantly in a plasma outburst so that's another question to think of as well you know what if species are destroyed and petrified and reduced in size and then further destroyed and petrified i mean what if the underground bases that are here on earth are set up as some sort of a safety mechanism in order to preserve the species because those who set them up know that these cyclic cataclysms happen or what if these bases are set up as some sort of an incubation process to get the life that was once here and further reduce it in size to the point that you can fit it onto a circuit board i mean that kind of seems to be where we're going as well even when you look at our cities folks our cities look very much like circuit boards when you see these cities photographed from very high up like from in space or whatever they look like circuit boards they look like open sores on the landscape but they also look like circuit boards and there was a documentary that came out recently a couple of years ago which i truly found to be quite fascinating it sort of offended a lot of people i think they were horrified that anyone could think this way and it was deemed to be a completely stupid concept by so many people locked into the mainstream box but it was by a russian guy and it was called there are no forests on the earth he called the video there are no forests on the flat earth because he wanted to attract the attention of the flat earthers to this hypothesis that he was presenting but what he was presenting was the concept of giant silicon trees silicon life forms that once existed here the concept that the tabletop mountains that we see across venezuela and across so many other places are all in fact tree stumps and that we're running around in the long grass and it was a very very interesting hypothesis and as strange as it may seem to a lot of people when you apply occam's razor and you apply the type of logic that i was outlining with that quote earlier by george santiano or whoever it was it actually does begin to make a lot of sense of course you don't want to just jump in and believe it because confirmation bias will lead you wherever it wants to lead you but it really does begin to make a lot of sense it really does explain a lot of what we see on the earth it explains why there's so many cities beneath the ocean all buried in water and sand it also explains where the sand may have come from 
You know, the concept that we're told by the mainstream, that this was simply created via the ocean rubbing against rocks and slowly dissolving rocks over time, I mean, this is a hell of a lot of dissolving to do, folks, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And if that's what caused it, well, what's all these cities doing buried beneath it all over the place? How does that factor into any of it? But if there were giant silicon trees, such as the tabletop mounds we see in Venezuela and all over the place, I mean, there's these messes all over the earth. If these are actually tree stumps and these trees were cut down by some sort of enormous machinery, the question is, what would the sawdust from that machinery look like? And here we have sand, which is made of silica and very much appears to be the type of thing you would see if you were to chop down a silicon tree. I mean, this is what you'd get as sawdust, folks. It would be silica sand, exactly as we're seeing in our oceans. And I just think these are very, very interesting things to look at. Another question is, you know, all of the spiked mountains that we see that are so jagged, we're told that these are simply eroded by time, wind erosion and all that sort of stuff. But if they were made from wind erosion, why have they got sharp, jagged corners on them, sharp, jagged rocks? Wouldn't all of these corners have been rounded by the wind? Why do they all look the same as broken tree stumps? You know, and I know it's pretty out there thinking for a lot of people, and I'm not saying that it's true. I'm simply asking the question, is it a possibility? And when you look at it, well, yeah, it is a possibility. It just depends on how prepared you are to think outside the box. Of course, the size is what freaks people out. The sheer scale of these trees, if they were real, and the sheer scale and size of the machinery, any machinery that would have been used to cut it down. I mean, these are saw blades that virtually would have filled the sky from our perspective. The question is, you know, how big do we think we are? How big are we? Are we really as big as we think we are, or are we the little people? Are we simply like the fairies? Are we simply like Tinkerbell, only we've lost our wings and we're running around in the long grass with amnesia and we're destroying what is left of our habitat for the overlords who are hidden from view? Could that be what's going on here, folks? Just a question. But it's one that needs to be asked because, you know, we really get to a point where none of this makes sense from human perspective. None of what we see on the world today makes sense from a human perspective, even if you look at those who control things. I mean, none of what they're doing even works for them. I mean, how much power do they think they need, and, and what is the power do they believe they have even? What is really going on here? Because it isn't just about all of these wars and money and all the stuff we see. This earth is being strip mined. As I said back in my film, The Awakening, back in 2010, the earth is being strip mined, and you've got to question where it's all going. The huge mines that we have that we see all over the face of this earth, where are all these minerals going? I mean, do we seriously need this much stuff just to build these prefab cities that we've got, these throwaway cities which don't appear like they're built to last at all? And, you know, do we really need all this stuff just for the parts in our laptops, the components in our mobile phones, the way we're told? Does it really take a mine the size of some of the mines we see to pull out that much bauxite because you need it for microchips in phones and this sort of stuff, you know, silicon for the CPUs in computers and stuff? I mean, really, folks, none of what we are presented with as being real on this earth makes any sense at all when held up to scrutiny. And you have to question what is really going on here. And how big was the life that once existed on this earth? And as I said, it's a strange thing for people to think about. It is, you know, the most impossible thing you'd ever want to think about. Even way even beyond flat earth. You know, it's just something that is so out there, right out of left field for a lot of people, the concept of silicon life. But look at some of the stuff that we see. I mean, look at some of the stuff that you see in the petrified forest in Arizona. All those petrified trees that are lying all over the ground. We're told are petrified trees anyway. I mean, it's one thing for something to petrify. For something to get locked on the ground, lying on the ground, it gets covered in sediment and it turns to stone. But how does it turn to semi-precious gems? How does it turn into gemstones? How does wood ever turn into gemstones, no matter what you do to it? And who cut these things? These are all sawed, all these so-called logs lying there. Who cut them all? And I would suggest that they're not even logs, they're simply twigs. 
simply small branches off the much, much larger trees, which we can see the remnants of all over the place in the form of these tabletop mountains. Yeah, and it, again, is it true? I don't know if it's true. But it certainly makes a lot of sense when you look at things. And the possibility of it, well, the possibility is there. There's not too much else that explains the existence of these flat mountains. I don't see why a mountain would grow to be flat like that or end up being flat like that by natural means. And there's so many of them, and they're all virtually the same height, all cut off. They all look like tree stumps. It's an interesting thing. If they're not silicon tree stumps and... We're not living on the floor of a mine, then I don't know where we're living, folks, because it really does make a lot of sense. Again, I'm not saying it's true, but it's uh, certainly an interesting way to look at things. And when you start considering the possibility that we do reduce in size every time there's one of these resets, well, I don't know, you've got to wonder. You really do have to wonder. I mean, a lot of it really comes down to people's concept of size and how big they are and how big everything else is. But how big do we know we are? I mean, what are we comparing it to? What's the yardstick? And all we've got to compare it to is the trees around us and the other people around us. But how do we know really what the scale of things is? You know, it's like the film Ants. I don't know whether you ever saw the film Ants. And they were just living in that little tiny pond and they thought that was their entire world because they're just so tiny. How do we know we're not that tiny in comparison to other life forms that may exist, possibly even here on this earth, that we simply don't know about because we're kept in an enclosed area on the earth. You know, how do we know that's not true? How do we know that's not what's going on? Like I said, folks, it's just dependent on how much people are prepared to think outside the box. And when you look at it and you begin to just explore the concept and the concept that consciousness has something to do with it, that human stature and the stature of life itself is controlled by the state of consciousness. It's just an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing to think of. You know, and you've got to ask, why is our pineal closed down? Why are we so closed down? What's the point of all the things that have been done to us? Because it's not just curious that we're in this state. It's not just interesting that we're in this state. It's incredibly significant, especially when you look at all the ancient texts and the ancient teachings which put so much emphasis on spirituality, so much emphasis on human physiology in order to obtain high levels of spirituality, i.e. the pineal gland, the brain stem, all the stuff that we see depicted in these ancient texts and these ancient statues and all of this stuff. You know, it's not just curious, folks. It's very, very significant. One of the problems, of course, is even attempting to bring this information up for discussion really offends a lot of people. You know, religious programming has a lot to do with that, unfortunately. If you think outside many people's religious boxes, they get incredibly offended. They start accusing you of being New Age or pantheism or anything else they can think of. Anything that doesn't support their book is evil, according to these people. And, you know, I would suggest that these books have been written, these religions have been created simply to separate us and hide this knowledge from us. And even when I look at the state of Europe in the Tartarian era, look at some of the old churches, look at some of the old leaders, we find depictions of Christianity and Islam working hand in hand, side by side. We find Christian leaders wearing Islamic symbols. We find Islamic leaders wearing Christian crosses. It was all the one thing. You know, all the peoples were given a different book, a different faith, but it all comes from the same place. The question is, why were they all given different ones? Why, when they all do come from the same place, what happened to separate them? You know, that's an interesting question, but ultimately it's these belief systems that continue the separation because people will simply not see the correlation between them all. And I think that they all work together, folks. And I think that it's been a very, very damaging thing for the human experience, the introduction of religion over the human psyche. It really has. It causes people to sit back and view all this stuff but not do anything about it, think that someone's coming to save them. And it kind of sends people into a state of apathy. And when I say apathy, I mean a state of inaction anyway, a state of ego-based inaction because they believe that they don't have to do anything. All they have to do is believe and they will be saved. They can allow the world to turn to hell around them. And as long as they believe, they will be saved. And their mere action of doing this is one of the main contributing factors to the world actually turning to hell around them. 
Yeah, unfortunately, I've met a lot of Christians who are relishing the concept of the end times. They want to see the world turn to chaos. They want to see hell on earth because they believe that means that they're going to be saved. They believe that as soon as it gets so bad that it can't be handled anymore, then their saviour is going to come and they're going to be saved. Even though they never did anything to save themselves during the whole experience, they never followed the teachings of the man they are claiming to follow. They simply waited for him to come back and do the work for them. And really, that's not what it's about, folks. You know, if you want to get into religion, the Christ figure had a great message. And if people were to put that message into practice and behave in the way he behaved, we would change the world in a day. But I don't see anywhere where he said, don't do anything, folks. Wait for me to come back and do it all for you. I don't think that was part of the plan. I think he would be horrified if he knew a religion had been constructed around his teachings. I really don't think that was what it was about at all. And I may have offended a lot of people with that, but I don't know, folks. I see religion on all sides of the fence. All religions, I see them as being hugely detrimental to the human experience. And I see them as being a huge part of the control grid. That's a part that most people are in complete denial of. You know, most people believe that everything's a lie, everything's been changed, all the books have been miswritten and rewritten, and everything's been hidden from us, but not this book. This book is true because this book is this book. And that's the way they are. It's an incredible thing how they can think that this one tome managed to survive the ravages of corruption simply because it is labelled as the Word of God. Do we really know that, folks? I mean, personally, I don't think God uses a pen. I don't think God would have written anything down himself. I think that whatever is in the book is written by people. And really, I think it all serves a particular agenda. And I don't think that agenda has anything to do with freedom. I really don't. I think it's been a huge part of the control mechanism, something that really keeps us down. And the world would not have been able to even achieve this amount of disrepair and been brought to the point that it has today were it not for the introduction of religion and the apathy and inaction that comes from those belief systems that has been introduced over the human psyche. And well, folks, we have now reached that time where we have now gotten to the end of the show. They do seem to come about quite quickly when I'm talking about history. I do like this topic. And folks, thank you again to all the people who came to the Anarchadelphia gig last weekend. It was a very enjoyable gig. Next week, I will be speaking at the Avatars of the Earth Gathering in Mount Shasta. That is happening on the 26th, the 27th and the 28th of this month, the month of September 2019. So if you're in Northern California, I'll look forward to seeing you there if you're coming. I won't be doing a gig next weekend, folks, because I'm going to be at Mount Shasta. I don't even know whether there'll be an internet connection there, so I don't know that it would be possible for me to do a gig anyway. The following weekend, I'm going to be attending a wedding in Spokane, Washington. I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to get a show out or not. I might be able to get a show recorded before I get to the wedding and posted on the wedding day. But if I can't, then it may possibly even be two weeks before you hear from me again. Unless any interviews come up or whatever, I haven't looked at my calendar, so I'm not sure whether I've got anything booked or not. But you may get a show the week after next, you may not, it just depends. If you don't, if it is two weeks before you get a show, then I will be sure to get one out to you the following week. And then the following week after that, I'll be back in Australia and, and things will be back to normal, back to regular occurrences. And we'll get the kookaburras and the birds in the background rather than the LA traffic noise. So that'll probably be a pleasant change for everybody as well. But thank you to everybody for tuning in today. Thank you to all the people who send me so many kind emails. Thank you to my Patreon supporters because I couldn't do any of this if it wasn't for your support. Thank you to all the new subscribers on YouTube. YouTube is kind of locked up for the last few days i've noticed folks my subscription count has been sitting at exactly 181,000 subscribers for the last three days it has not gone up it has not gone down it's like they've simply frozen the subscriber count so i don't know what that's all about but be interesting to see how that pans out with the channel but again folks thank you for tuning in today it's been a pleasure to come and talk to you again interesting topics hopefully some food for thought for everybody and I'll look forward to speaking to you again, possibly the week after next, but if not, then as soon as I'm able. Please take very good care until then. In luck, Kesh.